we're very gratified that you all are here. Um, I'm, I'm Mark Taylor from the Department of Religion, uh, Columbia, uh, and I've worked with Ned and Richard to, uh, on this, but uh, the labor has been theirs. Ned is going to offer opening remarks, but before we do that, we're very, very privileged to have here uh, uh, someone from the Danish consulate uh, here in New York, uh, Jarl Fries Manson. Uh, they've been very supportive of this whole endeavor. Uh, I, you can well imagine this is a very, very big weekend in, in Copenhagen uh, as well, so we're delighted to be able to share a little of that uh, excitement on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, so we, we really appreciate your interest, support, and are very, very appreciative of your being here. So uh, I'll turn it over, and then, and then Professor Phelps will take over. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when Søren Kierkegaard considered his uh, 39th uh, birthday in retrospect, uh, he wrote that he, his attention was to celebrate this uh, with something new, something that he had never tasted uh, before, uh, namely American oil which is a strong, what was the name at the time for a strong laxative castor oil uh, that was called American oil at the time. Uh, whether the taste or uh, the effect of this novel medical supplement was found exciting or distasteful by the Danish philosopher, we do not know. Uh, nor do, do we know what his thoughts of America was um, because he actually he drank American oil, but he never went to American soil. He never set his foot in this country. He actually never traveled a lot. What he preferred to do was basically walk uh, the streets of Copenhagen. So he was living the life of a modern and uh, cosmopolitan uh, citizen more in the spirit than in actual mobility, unlike uh, Hans Christian Andersen, whose motto was to travel is to live. But the antidote of drinking this reputedly ill-tasting American oil as a special birthday treat uh, certainly demonstrates the sarcastic humor and notorious ambivalence for which Kierkegaard has later become world renowned and which seems to ring a particular cheerful today, Sunday, May 2013, which marks the 200th birthday of one of the most uh, famous Danes of all time. And I'm sure that he would be very proud to know that he's being celebrated uh, here in, in New York on this 200th anniversary. So even if it has been uh, 200 years uh, since uh, uh, Kierkegaard's birth, he never ceased to appear relevant to our present lives. And he continues to surprise us with his peculiar modern, sometimes even postmodern, sensibility even if he lived a century before the postmodernism. I think for this reason, uh, Kierkegaard bicentral uh, will be celebrated as it was uh, mentioned uh, in Copenhagen at the uh, Royal National Library where actually Paul Haltengraber of the New York Public Library will be the moderator in Copenhagen, but not just in Copenhagen here in New York, but actually all over the world. Um, Kierkegaard's characteristic attention to the multiple and minute details of human existence and all its physical and emotion goes hand in hand with his grand uh, preoccupation with philosophical themes of the individual lot in a world on the brink of modernity. Yet Kierkegaard's work do not constitute an abstract philosophical system but describe an analysis many of the passions and potentials that fills the lives of modern people then and today. For example, business, which he thought was the most ridiculous thing in the world. For that reason, he would probably find New York a strange place. Uh, but also things like uh, boredom, despair, anxiety, humor, belief in God, doubt, irony, love, and uh, seduction, many of the themes that will be covered on today's uh, seminar. Part of his attractiveness in our world today is his attention to tear the reader out uh, from among the anonymous, uh, uncritical mass. According to Kierkegaard, as you 
probably all know, one is not oneself as a matter of course, but one can become so by taking a position, by making a choice, something which resonates with modern day media culture and management philosophy. I'm also sure that you know that uh, approximately half of what Kierkegaard uh, wrote uh, was under uh, different uh, synonyms and the other half of his writing, mostly the religious, uh, was written under his uh, own name. And by writing under uh, synonyms, um, Kierkegaard could give the choice, uh, the voice to different possible attitudes to existence and provoke readers to select a position for themselves. When Kierkegaard died in 1855 at the age of, of 42, he had written 40 books and uh, 40 uh, newspaper articles in forms of novels, discourses, longer philosophical, theological, literary, or psychological analysis. And far beyond the border of Denmark, interest in Kierkegaard's philosophy has been increasing since the 19th century. His works have inspired different types of existentialist thinking. In the beginning, it was in Germany and France, later on in Japan and the US, and then later on after the fall of the Berlin Wall, also in, in Eastern Europe, in Russia, and in, in China. So today, Kierkegaard's writings are read by people all over the world who are interested in philosophy, universal human problems. But Kierkegaard's thoughts are also used and recycled in many other sometimes surprising contexts. Uh, it can be traced in anything from, from Twitter to sport, from children's books to architecture. My friend, this is what Franz Kafka called Kierkegaard in his uh, diary on 21st August 1913. In addition, American President Franklin D. Roosevelt discovered Kierkegaard's work in 1944 and stated that Kierkegaard gives a better understanding of the inhumanity of the Nazis. And actually, ac according to, to the news, um, there's a Clinton dog that's named CERN. Uh, I'm sure that this dog with that name probably has some kind of an attitude uh, problem, but uh, uh, as you might also know, uh, Kierkegaard is, is, has a strong presence in the arts, also here in, in, in New York City, where, for example, the New Yorker of all New Yorkers, uh, Woody Allen, uh, has quoted him in films uh, like uh, Manhattan and To Rome with Love, and, um, and uh, he actually said, let's see if I can find this, um, that uh, he, it really gave him a misty eye, uh, Woody Allen, when he read Kierkegaard, although he didn't understand a word of it. Uh, uh, in 1992, uh, Daniel Lieberkind, in, in cooperation with the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts, created the exhibition in Danish, in Anelse Observatorium, an observatory of premonition. Uh, the exhibition was shown in Berlin and in Copenhagen and interpreted philosophical, sculptural, architectural, and tonic places in Copenhagen where Kierkegaard lived. It's a great pleasure to see that Mr. Liebekin is among the distinguished speakers here today. Um, at the more kitschy end of things uh, are daily tweets about Kierkegaard on Twitter. An example is the reality star Kim Kardashian tweet under Kim Kierkegaardashian. Uh, and so far it goes, the multifacious appearances of the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard in our global technology world, driven world of today. Um, if we look at one of the topics uh, of today, or the, the main topic, the headline, uh, the individual, one might wonder what Kierkegaard would say about uh, the debate that takes place now in the aftermath of the financial uh, crisis. As you know, there is, both in Washington and in Europe, uh, big discussions about how much state and how much uh, capitalism. The Economist recently called the Scandinavian uh, welfare models uh, the a potential supermodel, something that other countries could learn from. Uh, you might also have read on the cover of the New York Times uh, last Sunday that, on the one hand, uh, Denmark is reforming its welfare state, but on the other hand, there were several like, examples of pe people living off welfare and, and basically cheating all the others and, and, and sort of misusing the welfare state. 
So uh, this has sparked the debate, which I'm sure is, is, is very relevant uh, for the Institute of Capitalism and Society about uh, cuddly capitalism and cutthroat capitalism and whether the welfare state is actually able to bring about innovation. Um, of course, you know, I mean, being the Consul General of Denmark here in New York, I mean, you, you know that uh, I have to defend my country, but, but uh, on the other hand, if you look at statistics, you will find that, uh, that Denmark is known to have, you know, the highest participation of the labor force in the world. Um, it is one of the best places to do business in the world. The, the level of GDP per capita is basically the same level uh, as the U.S. And as you also know, it is the happiest people in the world. So it is clear that there's a, there's a limit to how critical you can be to the society that we have built up. I want to, to warmly thank uh, Professor Phelps and, and Professor Robs of Columbia University uh, and the Center for Capitalism Society and Department for uh, Religion and uh, for the initiative to, to host this uh, seminar here today. You have put together a densely themed program, an impressive lineup of speakers, counting many of the most interesting Kierkegaard interpreters and thinkers within the field working in the U.S. today. Very much look forward to being enlightened by these conversations and debate sessions, and then I look forward to participating in the dinner tonight at ACME, where the Danish chef, Mads Refslund, who's actually the co-founder of Norma, the world's top two restaurant in the world, uh, is going to, to, uh, to cook. And I'm sure that that experience will taste much better than American oil. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for those inspiring words. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Edmund Phelps. Um, as director of the uh, center, I'm going to offer some introductory remarks. And uh, Professor Mark Taylor, chairman of the religion department, will offer uh, some uh, closing remarks. Um, <clears throat> the Department of Religion and the Center on Capitalism Society are the co-hosts co uh, uh, of this um, conference. Uh, <clears throat> before I uh, make a few introductory remarks, I'm trying to explain what economics has to do with, with all this or what all this has to do with economics, uh, I, I'd like to... Uh, express thanks to uh, several people uh, for, for making this possible. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank the Consul General of Denmark, Jarl Fius Madsen, excuse my pronunciation, for his encouragement. And um, Maiken Derno, I believe she's not here today, the cultural attache for her considerable help in, in putting on this event. Um, Richard Robb, in the Center on Capitalism and Society, and a professor at Finance at Columbia. And uh, Mark Taylor, department chairman at, um, of the, the um, Department of Religion, <clears throat> are the spearheaders of this conference, and it's uh, really their, their brainchild. Um, I want to thank also uh, Phil Coldiron, the administrative manager of the center, for doing many, many tens of hours of work uh, to uh, get this uh, production uh, on the boards. And also Jeff Nagy, my assistant, for chipping in at numerous times. <coughs> well, Professor Taylor is a renowned Kierkegaard scholar, um, and I'm not. Um, the trick I have to perform is to say a few words on the importance of Kierkegaard for the understanding and appreciation of modern capitalism, which is the center's focus, without being a, a Kierkegaard scholar, and without being very sure that Kierkegaard was keen on modern capitalism either. Um, it's possible that he wasn't always consistent, you know. 
Uh, <clears throat> some of Kierkegaard's contributions, uh, as, you, as many of you know better than I do, won him the title of the father of existentialism. For example, he was the first philosopher to insist that experiences of anxiety are part of the human condition. However, <clears throat> what may be his greatest contribution, and certainly the contribution of, of the greatest interest for uh, modern economics, uh, went well outside uh, psychology and, and religion. This was his thinking on the dynamics of the individual self and the importance of choices and decisions in human life. Kierkegaard believed that all individuals are radically free, plotting their own future, and in the process, shaping their own identity. His first book, Either Or, suggests that life is one choice after another, and the decisions we make define who we are. Since the knowledge human beings have is limited, every true decision, by that I mean a decision that's not just a routine action, every true decision represents a leap of faith that must be made without any clear understanding of the consequences. And that's why decisions provoke anxiety. The ramifications of this for economics are profound, I think. When Kierkegaard writes of the need of an individual to make decisions with little foreknowledge of the consequences, he appears to be describing life in the modern economies that began to electrify much of the West in the 1800s. I'm referring to the economies that came to possess the dynamism to generate the indigenous innovation that began in that century to revolutionize work and careers in many or most industries in Britain, America, and parts of continental Europe, including, I'm sure, Denmark. In these economies or industries, knowledge may fall short because an individual is trying something new or trying something in a new setting or because the consequences of the decision will be affected by the unknown decisions of others. <clears throat> Kierkegaard's message for economics does not stop there. What is striking to me is that in Kierkegaard's view, if I understand it, the impossibility of truly knowing the best decision time and again is not an unavoidable difficulty of, leaving, of living, neither is it a difficulty made avoidable uh, by the, the nanny state, <clears throat> the cuddly state. Um, it is instead an invaluable wellspring uh, uh, of experiences that can provide us with full personal growth. As Mark put it so beautifully in a, a little paper we've been working on, uh, Kierkegaard insists that anxiety is not an illness that can be cured by psychoanalysis or pills, but is the mark of an open future and the price individuals pay for being personally responsible for their lives. Kierkegaard's best known aphorism uh, can only reinforce this impression that Kierkegaard was all, all in favor of uh, the modern life that I described. Um, this aphorism appears to urge us to devote our careers to undertaking unending ventures into an unknown future. And it advises us to demand of our politicians a modern society that makes such careers possible. <clears throat> the aphorism, which many of you know, is life can, can only be understood backwards, but it be, must be lived forwards. So Kierkegaard, among other things, was also the first philosopher of the modern economy. <clears throat> 